Hey Staten Island, this is Health Wish, a conversation about the state of healthcare in the fabulous fifth borough. Our aim is to raise issues, raise awareness, and raise health. Because when we raise health, we raise everyone. Today, we're back in conversation with Drs. Nicole Burwald, Pamela Foyer, and Ronique Galad, who compare notes about finding balance in career and family. Give a listen. I'm going to switch gears for a minute. Because when I, when I thought about us coming here, I had a lot of thoughts about what to talk about. And one of the things that people ask me about as someone who's a chair and a director and a mother currently, which I didn't necessarily for myself anticipate going into this career, is how can you do it though? I want to do X, Y, and Z in my life. How can I be a physician? How can I be a director of a service, let alone someone who's coming to take care of patients? So I know this is something we all tackle on a daily basis and think about ways of doing it and perhaps some barriers we anticipated, some that were materialized and some that didn't. But when you were taking on these other ideas, I'm going to become an intensivist, I'm going to become a surgeon, a neurosurgeon. Did you think about any of these things? Maybe not enough. Maybe I didn't think about them enough because I made a choice based on what I was passionate about and and what I was good at, you know, and seemed to have the skill set for. And it was a tough lifestyle choice. I started in training not only in pediatrics, pediatric critical care, um, before there were limits on the hours that trainees worked. I still work some of those hours as an attending physician, uh, middle of the night, 14, 16 hours, kind of like Ronit's long operative cases or your long shifts in the, in the emergency room. So I kind of pushed that aside. But what was important to me, and I think what was helpful, is maintaining a group of friends so that I had a support system. And uh, for me, I became actually an adult athlete. That was my outlet. So finding ways to get joy out of doing other things, you know, physical things, uh, arts. But one of the best compliments I ever got was when I was teaching fellows. Those are trainees within my field. Several of the women fellows came up to me and said, you're our lifestyle mentor. And that was, I think, the biggest compliment I've ever had. But to be told that, you know, made my day. I was giddy. That would make my day too. Mm-hmm. Any thoughts? You yeah, juggle so, a lot of things, I know. So the question of balance is always that that difficult one. And because everybody, every individual is different mm-hmm. and has different priorities and want to accomplish different things in terms of their career and, and home. But like you said earlier, Nicole, it takes a village for mm-hmm. that too. And, and if We all make choices, and I don't regret for one minute any of the choices I've made, but I can't be sitting here and telling you that I can do the things I want to do in the hospital out there without giving credit to my husband at home who takes care of everything. And so I've been able to do the things I do because of the support I have at home. Yeah, you know, I... I think about the things you're saying. And when Pam said, when you said, I didn't give it a lot of thought, you know, I I don't think I did either, except one thought, which was when you were talking about the way you felt about the mentors at college at Bryn Mawr, that they were professionals in something. You didn't say they were physicians. They were professionals Mm -hmm. in something and you wanted to be like them. I think I would have landed in something that would have taken some good part of my time and dedication. So I'm not sure when I, when, you know, young women ask me about medicine and juggling things and trying to find some sort of imbalance or perfect imbalance, Mm -hmm. sometimes I revert back, well, if it's not medicine, will it be something else? And you're going to have to navigate your life some way. But if you feel you have something important to contribute, go for that, right? Go for it. You you can't do it alone. And and I I think of this story when I think of this topic, someone very close in my life um, called me after having a child crying. I can't be the best mother and the best sister and the best daughter and the best friend and the best dentist and the best, the list went on and on. And my response said, who said you were, right? Be the best of the thing you have to do in that moment. And the rest follows. Yeah, you don't, you balance it out. You figure out when Mm -hmm. to be your best, any of the things that you use to describe yourself. But if you're going to be a a director of a, a medical service, 
or in some other industry that you feel passionate about that takes your time, there are ways to figure all those things out, I think. And it doesn't happen, it's not always perfect all the time. Even yeah. if you put together the team, and we all have teams, sometimes you fall short of that and have to reset. And I think you know, this pandemic had us all thinking about how do we take care of ourselves again? I mean, for me, I just started private Pilates lessons because I had to then, you know, refocus on mm -hmm. some time for me. I take care of my octogenarian parents. Yeah, I mean, I think you raise another really good point. We all think about child care. Mm -hmm. It's not always on the tip top of everyone's mind to think about elder care or whoever you have to care for. Um, and it really sort of spreads out the thought around how we can be responsible for the people in our lives mm -hmm. and what, how that factors in to all of these decisions. And I think we're gonna see that more and more. And we know that women in healthcare also went home and did all of the things that women do to run their households and, and take care of their other responsibilities as well. Homeschool some children, <laughs> little things people didn't anticipate might happen in their busy lives. Yes, absolutely. And I think we've seen that publicized and it's mm -hmm. organic, like you said, right? Things unfold and change as we go. Mm -hmm. What do you hope to see change or to bring to healthcare on Staten Island to this community we all clearly have stated we feel tied to? As a more senior woman in medicine and my experience taking care of very critically ill children and families, there's a lot of education I can provide to the healthcare team, but to these families to be able to take care of their kids. So that's, that's one aspect of it. The second is I want the people coming into the system into healthcare careers, not just the physicians, but the nurses, the therapists, to see other people who look like them yeah. and have thrived in what they're doing. And I didn't have as much of that. Um, even though pediatrics itself is a women-dominated field, the specialty of pediatric critical care was not when I was training and I didn't have a tremendous amount of role models who were just like me. I would love to showcase what we have at our hospital. We have great people, great physicians, great nurses, physician assistants, uh, advanced care providers, the personnel in the hospital so that the community could see that we can provide outstanding care, great outcomes, uh, provide state-of-the-art care right here on Staten Island. You don't have to go elsewhere. Yeah, and I do think that, and I've been, like I mentioned, I've been here over a decade, the services we offer and the quality of care, it has moved with the times, and it's great. And Dr. Ardolik always says, no Staten Islander should ever leave Staten Island for care. And I think we can deliver that, and I, it's sort of at the heart of why Pam said she came here, right? This type of service, in as a robust way, need, there's a platform to develop it further, mm -hmm. and for our patients and our community not to have to travel in a difficult time when they have a sick child, or they need neurosurgery, and can't get back home from the, the hospital quickly, right? That's mm -hmm. even, just getting home after neurosurgery is a big deal. <laughs> Everything about neurosurgery is a big deal. <laughs> um, but but it, it, it's, it's interesting to think what we can bring. And I, I do think that we have so much developing. We actually get to put our fingerprints on it. Yeah. So, and look back and see, oh, I had a role in that, you know, and that's very satisfying. You know, I like thinking about how the place is developing, and it's developing in a lot of other ways, too. But my own department has over 50% women who work for me as physicians, which isn't surprising, right? When you have a director who's a woman, maybe it brings more. But Renee, your field is even more male-dominant than mine, and your department is not. I'd love to sort of get a, a sense of what it feels like to be in your department. Absolutely. So uh, the statistic is that roughly less, even less than 10% of all neurosurgeons are women, but we are in a very unique situation uh, where three of five of us are women, highly accomplished neurosurgeons in our department. But I'm so fortunate to be in, in that, that group because I do feel that we've been able to accomplish more together than each of us individually. There are less than 20% of women are deans, chairs, directors, and you also have women directors, and it's a lot. And you know, obviously, we love our male colleagues, we love our female colleagues. There is a perspective that is gender-oriented and a, a scope, and I think it brings something to have departments that are run by women. Clearly, I'm biased. 
for, for obvious reasons. But I think there's something to bring and say, and I, I think it's quite an accomplishment that we have that in our hospital. You know, and um, Dr. Foyer and I, we work intimately, and I'll let her speak to a little bit as she's heavily involved, in generating a collaborative network of the women in our, in our hospital together to do some work. Yes, we have this Women in Medicine Committee. We have mentoring groups. And just recently, Nicole and I and several others presented some talks on negotiation for other women physicians throughout Northwell, but also just the collaboration of working on a project together with the people outside your field and, you know, just being responsible for that. It was a it was a great time. I mean, we sat and talked like this you know, in the midst of developing, I think, a superb presentation. You know, <laughs> so. I think is that there are barriers when you're in a group that within your discipline or within whatever sort of context is, let's say, a minority, right? Mm -hmm. um, or not dominated by that group. And for us in medicine, it is women. And those networks bring so much value. And the, mm -hmm. the idea for us to bring it to our local institution is something I have have felt in my, throughout my career in different ways, through national, local, regional organizations of women medicine groups. And it really helped me, I believe, get to where I am mm -hmm. as a leader. I, I think it gave me tools to navigate my career from clinical medicine into some of the administrative side, quality, patient safety, things that I'm responsible for that I would not have necessarily had my eye on if I had not had these mentors and to pay that forward and to mm -hmm. develop each other. I mean, you guys have both broke down barriers that we've already mentioned. Literally just being at medical school and pursuing a residency at the time that you did and being in a field that is less than 10%, I mean, those barriers are broken. And, and the things we can do to help elevate our colleagues in an equitable way, right? We always bring men to the table, but to show where the value is that may have been overlooked um, because mm -hmm. it is part of history and we don't ignore it, but there is a big future ahead mm -hmm. of us. Exactly. We certainly want to encourage more women to enter into a neurosurgery residency and really elevate that, that number. Um, and I'm just so fortunate to be a, in a, I think, a role model group and environment on, at SIUH um, in order to encourage other women in medical school mm -hmm. to enter this field. Having that role model and especially a role model in numbers mm -hmm. uh, the number of women is important for them to be able to see that it can be done yeah and i think some of it goes back to what we we're saying there's some perceived barriers when you approach anything that is perceived as difficult and time consuming but there's so many ways to approach the same problem and mm -hmm. to have a successful outcome but knowing it's been done before and listening to your stories i think it should at the very least be motivating Mm -hmm. uh, for others. So Pam, you already mentioned that you became an adult athlete, that that's mm -hmm. a great outlet for you. And I think it goes back when I think about it, to the idea of wellness, mm -hmm. like the things we can do for ourselves outside of this other busy lifestyle that we lead. Any other tricks that you have? Just really finding the things that give you some joy. They can be simple things. For me, it's sometimes walking in the morning with my dog. And the other thing is I think Northwell as a system and Staten Island University Hospital has allowed us in this past year and a half to really think about and focus on wellness and what we call mindfulness or doing some things that are relaxing. So again, everything's a balance. All of us have to find a little bit of time and the right thing for us but I think there's a better focus on it and I continue to do what's right for me and I encourage my colleagues and my trainees to also find that sweet spot. So I happen to know that Ronit has two young kids, <laughs> a very, very full schedule where she is at the hospital before the sun comes up for most of the year. How do you do it? If you don't take care of yourself, you can't take care of anybody mm -hmm. else. That's that's the bottom line. So you, you have to make time for it, take care of yourself. And uh, you can define taking care of yourself in different ways. Some define it as having going to the gym and, and having exercise time. Uh, for me, it is very important to carve out some time during the day to just be with the the people I love, my family, my friends, and being open when I'm going through a difficult time, 
um, sharing with my family and friends and being open with them, taking advice from my village at home and my friends and colleagues at work. And so that's, to me, important in terms of my, my wellness mm -hmm. to make sure I engage the people I, I'm friends with and trust and my family as well for my sanity. Yeah, similarly, I <laughs> feel like I have to protect time for, for that, for my mm -hmm. family. And, mm -hmm. and I, I have small children and making sure I have that time with them, that there's hours of the day that I'm not looking at my phone, which we're also connected to and looking at them and what they want to do. And it brings mm -hmm. joy. We want to raise our children. We want to be part of their lives. And it is not that difficult to make that time. You know, it's a funny thing as a scheduled type A person, I sort of schedule my wellness, which people might think is being unwell. But I do, I have um, maybe per, before it's this year spot. when we didn't know when we could travel or not travel, I could tell you my vacations that I have planned for the next 24 months almost. Mm -hmm. I know what's coming up. I know what I get to look forward to because it helps me have those things where I know I, I have that protected time to be with the people I love. I'll tell you what I actually think, the, and this gets left out of wellness, I think sometimes, when I think the most important parts of wellness is enjoying what you're doing when you're actually very busy. The things that keep you away from the other things you love, and I hear it from both of you of how you feel about your career. If you feel well when you're doing your job, taking, let me back up, taking a vacation can't make you happy if you don't like what you're doing every day. Mm -hmm. Nice vacation, but it can't undo those things. So if you find joy and passion in the things that you're doing, not putting aside that the exercise, the culture, the vacations, all those things are so valuable, but finding wellness and joy in what you do, I think it carries a long way. My daughter once asked me several months ago, why do you have to go to work? And I answered, I don't have to go to work, I want to. Yeah. <laughs> I actually had a very similar conversation, and I, but I think it's really powerful message. I love what I do, and not just the patient care, but supporting all the people who take care of every patient who comes to the emergency department, mm -hmm. making sure that they can have the best experience and how many times over that gets amplified. Yeah, I like to go do that. That makes me feel like I'm contributing. So it has been my pleasure to be here on Health Wish with my colleagues. Thank um, you. To, mm -hmm give a sense, a little more sense of what we do as women in healthcare, as directors, as physicians. We hope to be back and we hope on this program to be able to share what it is to be a nurse and a PA and um, involved in many different disciplines of medicine because, like we said, it takes a team and we'd love to see people join us. HealthWish wishes to thank our very special guest host, Dr. Nicole Burwald and her special guests, Drs. Pamela Foyer and Ronique Galad. We're very interested in your health wish. Contact us at healthwish at northwell.edu. Thanks for joining us. We hope to see you again soon.